Hello, hello. Yes. Welcome back, everyone. Yes. Yeah, we have an amazing arts and accessibility panel here today, and we're so grateful that each of you could join us. So I'm just going to start by sharing a bit of a description around what this panel will be talking about. So for the next 60 minutes or so, we'll be focusing on what it means to make the arts accessible to those with disabilities. What are the challenges and rewards? What are the barriers? And how can those be broken down? And when we're making art that tells the stories of those with disabilities, who gets to tell those stories? Are there rules when making inclusive art? What can we learn from Australia's arts access programs? So my name is Deb Sferber. I am the moderator for this panel. And it's not all about me, so I won't bore you with too much of my life story. What I will say is that I, I consider myself a creative. So I do a lot of poetry, spoken word. I have a blog. I published a book back in 2013 called A Living Alternative. I also have been involved in the disability community for about 10 years now, mostly with L'Arche for, for about seven years. And currently I serve as a chaplain at Luther Care Communities and also work as executive assistant with the 60 Scoop Healing Foundation. So that's just a little bit about me, but more importantly, it's about, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But more importantly, it is about the guests that we have today. So I'm going to start over here on my right. Our first speaker is Joanna Arnott. She uses pronouns she, her. Joanna is a multidisciplinary theater artist who works primarily as an actor, writer, stage manager, and newbie director. Joanna completed her intensive in audio description with Vocal Eye for theater in the fall of this year. She is passionate about theater and creating possibilities for others to share in that love. She has had the pleasure of putting practice into action, describing the fiance in December. Her favorite parts of the experience were the conversations she got to have afterwards with the community members who came and enjoyed theater in a way they never had before. When she's not working in theater, Joanna enjoys knitting, saying hi to dogs, and doing crosswords with her partners. <laughs> so let's all welcome Joanna. <laughs> Brenda Baker is here. Brenda is somebody that I've come to know and love over the past few months as we both attend this wonderful church, Grosvenor Park United. Brenda also, as many of you know, is the chair of the Connecting Communities uh, conference that's been hosted this weekend. So we've had the privilege to work together for the past several months. Brenda Baker is the founding director of Kids of Note, Saskatoon's hit all ability choir that rehearses and performs right here at Grosvenor Park United Church. In her volunteer life, she has received recognitions and awards from Community Living Association of Saskatoon Child and Youth Friendly, Friendly Saskatoon, the Saskatoon Preschool Foundation, and Canada Special Olympics, as well as being named YWCA Woman of Distinction and a U of S College of Arts and Science Alumni of Influence. For her work in the world of disabilities and her commitment to advancing the work of the United Church, Brenda recently received an honorary Doctorate of Divinity from St. Andrews College. She is an award-winning writer, songwriter, and recording artist whose past includes working as a touring musician. Her novel, Camp Outlook, explores her experience of having a child with Down syndrome. Brenda is the chair of the Connecting Communities Planning Group and oversaw GPUC's recent renovations to make the church more accessible. So let's all welcome Brenda. Okay, our next guest is Tatiana Roulette, who I have had the privilege of getting to know a little bit over the weekend here. Tatiana is by far the most famous person on the panel, <laughs> though very humble, and she would not tell me what her favorite song is, so I'm still planning to get that out of her by the end of the panel. 
But anyways, Tatiana is a beautiful, fun-loving 16-year-old girl whose birthday is June 30th, 2006. She is a daughter, sister, auntie, and friend. She loves her parents and her cat, Glissa. She loves singing and being on social media. She enjoys watching and singing with YouTube videos on a daily basis. Tatiana is a student in a grade 11 functionally integrated classroom. Most of her learning is hands-on, learning by doing. She has been in the Kids of Note Choir for nine years and just moved to the notations this fall. She was actually one of the performers last night for those who were able to be here. Did an awesome job. She also enjoys dancing, cheerleading, and swimming. Her face has been on several posters, and she's been interviewed for television as well. So see what I mean, she's famous. <laughs> Her goals are to be a good role model, to write music, to become famous, which she already is, and to be on the cover of a magazine. With her tenacity and love for life, we're sure she will achieve her goals. So let's all welcome Tatiana. <laughs> Our next speaker is Bev Brenna. And actually, I spoke to Bev just before the panel because Bev has been someone who was with us last night performing some of her written materials. And as well this morning, spoke on a different panel as well. And I asked Bev if there's anything more that I should say about her, and she just said, just tell the audience I love to write and that she's a disability advocate. So she's very humble. Uh, <laughs> but as was mentioned already, in case any of you were, you know, out having a little break or something, that she has a PhD from the University of Alberta. And her research has focused primarily on characters with disabilities. So she has a number of books that she's published. And, I actually saw that she had some of the books up here, so maybe during her presentation she'll be able to share a little bit more with us about that. So let's all welcome Bev. And finally, our speaker is Jody Simpson Liberty. She is one of three artistic directors with Dance Collective YXE. She has been teaching dance for 22 years, first starting with University School of Dance and then with the creation of Dance Collective three years ago. Her expertise lies in tap dancing jazz, as well as being the main instructor with the diverse dance classes. She was a creator of the Spirit Flyers Dance Program in 2001, who performed last night for those who were able to be here, which has grown from four to over 40 dancers amongst the various dance classes. She has also been the instructor for the Wheels in Motion a dance team whose primary mode of transportation is a wheelchair for the past 20 years. Jody currently teaches high school at Bethlehem Collegiate as an LAT, mathematics, and dance teacher, and keeps quite busy with her two girls. So let's all welcome Jody. Okay, so we're all going to start now. Each speaker will speak for five minutes. Before we do, I just want to give Tatiana with some tobacco. Miigwech for being here. Okay, let's start with Joanna. Would you like to introduce yourself and share a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here on behalf of theater. Uh, all theater, but specifically I'm here uh, from Persephone Theater in town. Um, I don't often speak as myself, so public speaking is hard when you're not a character. So <laughs> you can pretend. Make I'll pretend. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, uh, my name is Joanna Arnott, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a multidisciplinary theater artist. Um, and I work in the city also as an audio describer, describing plays and live theater for the blind and partially sighted community. So I received that training from a company called Vocal Eye that's in Vancouver and I, I received that training in early fall. And the training was actually paid for and supported by a group of theater companies here in Saskatoon, namely Persephone Theater, Gordon Tatusis Naganiwan Theater, Shakespeare on the Saskatchewan, Sum Theater, and La Troupe Du Jour. These companies came together and noticed that there was something missing in our community to make theater more accessible to all audience members. So what is a described performance? What should you expect? 
As the describer, it is my job to describe the characters, the set, the costumes, the lights, and action that happens between the lines of dialogue. When you arrive at the theater, you will be given a headset and a receiver, similar to a walkie-talkie, but it's only one way. This way, you can control the volume to your liking. Before the show, there's an opportunity to join us on stage for a guided tour called a touch tour. This touch tour allows us to better describe the set, the characters, the props, and the costumes. For example, if a character wears a dramatic robe covered in velvet and feathers, this would be included in the touch tour for audience members to feel and understand the luxurious nature of the costume. After the touch tour, you will be seated and the describing will begin. For half an hour before the show, I describe everything in detail. I begin with the stage, where the play is set, what is on the floor, what is on the walls, is there any furniture in the room, paintings on the walls, how many doors are there, and where do they go? After the stage, I describe the characters. What do they look like? How is their hair done? Where are they wearing? How do they walk or move around the space? I describe their relationships to each other as well, how they know each other. My goal with the introduction is to give a clear sense of where we are. During the show, I speak only in between the characters' lines. I never want to overlap. I describe what the characters are doing physically on stage and also any changes to the environment. If the lights shift, I describe how they changed. If a new character enters, I describe what they are wearing and who they are. If anyone missed the half hour introduction before the show, I want their experience to be just as full as those who did. When describing, I never want to impose my feelings about a moment onto the description. I avoid adjectives and try to leave as much as I can to the interpretation of the audience. Things like, she walks away angrily. I might think she was angry, but another audience member might disagree. It's about being specific with our language. Why did I think she was angry? What about her walk gave me that impression? Is it because she stomped when she left the room? A better description in that case would be, she stomps out of the room. So um, that's what I am an, an, not an expert in, but know the most about in terms of uh, accessibility in theater is described performances. But Persephone and also theaters in Saskatoon are increasing their, um, their goals of accessibility and, and making sure that it's welcoming for everyone. So Persephone also offers um, ASL interpreted performances and relaxed performances as well. I'm fairly new to describing and I'm definitely learning as I go. The most important part to me is the feedback that I receive after the show. I want to know how I can do better. As a sighted person, I am definitely not the expert. If something was confusing or could have been better or could have better served your experience, I want to make those changes. Um, the goal is to create theater that is accessible and enjoyable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. That was fascinating because I know about the descriptions that happen with the closed captions and so forth, but I never really thought about all that went into it. So that was really cool to hear, hear from you about. Really that was really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Tatiana, I would love you to share a little bit with us about your famous career thus far. And can I say just quickly, Tatiana has invited me to be here with her because I know something about what she's going to talk about and she's given me permission to repeat things that she uh, might not have been quite as clear as she would have liked. So otherwise, I'm just going to sit back and enjoy Tatiana's talk as well. Dase, Anin, greetings in Cree and algebra. Hi, my name is Tatiana Roulette, and I am 16 years old. I am grateful to for being invited to speak here today about choir. I am in grade 11 at Delisle's Composite School. I am up at 5.30 a.m. and catch the school bus at 7.27. I joined the Kiss and Milk Choir when I was seven years old. I love, I love singing with the Kiss and Note for nine years, but now that I'm older, I joined the Notations. 
you probably heard us say last night. When I first joined Kids of Note, I met an older girl, and I really liked her. Her, her name is also Tatiana. I remember meeting Morgan, Sarah, Blair, Emily, Paul, Lexi, Anna, Jeremiah, and Emma. I really loved coming to choir to sing and laugh, but also see new friends. I remember losing a friend in notations a few years ago. Our concerts are here at the church, and lots of people come. They cheer and stand up at the end. We bow. As well as singing, I often MC concerts. We have a great band called The Sign Notes 2. When I was little, some of, some of the sounds at the band scared me, but now I am good, I am good at it. We do, we also do uh, outreach concerts, such as singing with a drive box and having a tuning drive and a pizza party after. One summer, we sang O Canada, then we then went for breakfast after while being in the choir is really fun. It takes a lot of practice and discipline. Sometimes I feel pressure. I am so proud to be a member of the choir. Being part of choir has given me a voice. I have confidence in my stuff right now. I practice every day by listening to the CD and reading the words to the songs. Some of my favorite songs that we sing are OZM, Sparkle, Glorious, Go Make a Difference, Jingle Bells, and the uh, Angels Among Us. We sang that song with our guest artist, Adelaide Laverty. We had many different guest artists, Bobby Willison and Crystal Harder, Elaine Fowler, and Heidi Mavo are just a few. At our spring concert on April 30th, Brenda Baker will be our guest artist. She is a great director and performer. <laughs> Someday, I want to be a famous singer and uh, on a Mexican cover. I would uh, also like to be featured in the movie. I want to be a role model. And I would uh, want to be able to know who I am. Uh, I also want to start dating a boy and travel by myself. <laughs> My birthday is coming up. June 30th, 2023, I will be 17 and most of all I love to sing. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Tatiana. Your music is always appreciated. I've been to two of your concerts now, which were really a lot of fun. I am very impressed that you wake up at 5.30 because I definitely would not be awake at that hour. <laughs> and I would like to ask you, you know, you mentioned that you have a pizza party after your concert. So what is your favorite kind of pizza? Well, my favorite kind of pizza is cheese pizza or pepperoni. Oh, good or, choice. Or, 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 ham, or ham and pineapple. Okay, good yes. choice, good choice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. Bev, would you like to share a little bit with us today, please? Oh, lovely. Lovely to sit with you, Tatiana, and I'm enjoying meeting you today. Um, I'm a fan of yours. <laughs> <laughs> and Joanna, I was interested in your work too. And Brenda, I know that you're a great director and performer, so nice to be with you. And Jody, I'm looking forward to hearing about you today too. So I guess I'm here really as a reader. Um, I've done a lot of research on children's literature, and so some of the things I'll talk about come from that research. In Canada, the children's book field is pretty new. Really, it didn't get rolling until the 1970s. So it's still a young field, and I think there's still lots of room for growth, especially where characters with disabilities are portrayed. Um, in about 2007, I went to Edmonton to do a PhD looking at characters with disabilities in kids' books. So I located 50 books published in Canada in a 15-year period starting in 1995. So I kind of went back into history, located these 50 books, and read them to look for patterns and trends 
in the portrayal of characters with disabilities. So here's a dozen things that I found. So number one, the books in the study sample were pretty equal when it came to males and females with disabilities. So I thought that was interesting. Number two, lots of books had the character with disabilities as a hero, as a protagonist instead of a sidekick, which I think before 1995, that was a common trend. So I was excited and, and pleased to see that. So if there was a character with a disability, they often were the hero, the protagonist. And often the story was told from that character's first person point of view. So it was a really engaging narrative. Uh, number three, there was a wide range of disabilities depicted. And that was quite different than earlier books in the 1900s. If there was a character with a disability, the disability was polio or visual impairment. And that was pretty standard. So I was interested to hear that and see that there were quite a few disabilities represented. Number four, and this is a big one, death in these newer books about characters with disabilities was not a popular option. So the character didn't die at the end of the book and they didn't get a miracle cure. Classic books, English books, often had this miracle cure if the character believed in a miracle enough, they would not have a disability anymore or else the, the author would kill them off, which was terrible, mm -hmm. terrible. So I was happy to see that had changed. But there were some concerning trends and patterns too. Uh, one was that few of these books were set in Western Canada or the territories, very few in Saskatchewan. So I felt we weren't really represented here uh, in these Canadian books. Most of the books were for older rather than younger readers. So young adult audiences were seeing themselves in books if they had a disability, but not so much middle grade and definitely not early chapter books. Realistic and historical fiction were really common genres of these 50 books. Not fantasy, not mystery, not high adventure. So there's a gap there that's concerning to me. None of the characters with disabilities also depicted LGBTQ plus characterizations or specific cultural backgrounds. So it felt to me as if authors who were writing about disabilities weren't able to imagine the character with any other aspect of diversity. So that was a concern. Uh, quite a few single parent households were described and most involved single moms. And that was interesting to me because in a couple of my early books where I do have a character with a disability that I wrote about, I, I had them with single moms too. And the reason I did that is because as a bit of a lazy author, I didn't want to have a whole lot of parents involved in my story. <laughs> <laughs> so I admit to feeding into this, you know, unhealthy pattern, I think. Um, an, a high number of negative self-images were portrayed in characters with disabilities in these 50 books, and I mentioned that last night. Um, there were just a couple of other things. One is that the characters with the disability didn't get to travel in the course of their novel. Uh, generally, characters in these novels stayed home. And when I think about Will Rogers and your presentation today and how much you talked about enjoying international travel, and traveling alone. And when I think about Greg Donaldson, who talked about winning awards for snowshoeing, traveling to Toronto, um, planning to travel to Russia, except not being able to go because of the war. I mean, this is a terrible stereotype to see in literature that characters with disabilities don't travel, because we know they do. Um, I was seeing a lot of uh, representations, different kinds of representations of mental health. But one concerning trend was, often it was the parents of the character, the mother or the father, that had mental health challenges, much more commonly the mother than the father. Uh, if the rare case occurred that the father in these books had a mental health challenge, he fixed it by the end of the book. And we know that that's not a realistic pattern, 
and why is this discrepancy between men and women and mental illness. So that was interesting. Um, there's some brilliantly written books in that bunch, but some concerning trends as well. So I think there's lots of room to grow in, in creating literature. Much more recently, I did another study of just picture books. So I, in a research team, read 2,000 picture books written in Canada in a four-year period. So books published in Canada in 2017, 18, 19, and 20. Um, and of these 2,000 books, very few of them show visibly a character with a disability. So that is a really concerning pattern and I think something that we're definitely going to want to see some changes um, about. So thanks for listening and uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Ruth. That really sounds like a big project you took on, 2,000 books over four years. I had them all on my front porch, and my husband was like, Bev, are these going to be here forever? And I'm like, maybe. <laughs> that is a lot of books. I'm just wondering, just off the top of your head, do you have one or two favorite children's books, whether or not they're about disabilities, just in general? Um, you know, I, I have a, a, a couple of books in my bag, and one of them is called Dark Wing by Kenneth Opal. And Darkwing is a fantasy novel. It's about arboreal gliders or precursors to bats. And there's one of these arboreal gliders that can't uh, glide. So it, this glider has a physical disability. And in the novel, there's one point where the glider flaps and discovers he can fly. And that's different than everybody else in his colony, and he's very much rejected for that. He goes to his sister, and he says to his sister, is different wrong? And the answer from her is really heartbreaking. And I think if everybody in the world read this passage and really thought about it, we'd do a better job with inclusion. Mm, wow, yeah. that's amazing. That's a throwback for me. I read Kenneth Opal when I was in grade eight. I won't tell you how old I am, but I will tell you that was quite a while ago, more than 20 <laughs> years ago. Let you do the math. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Jody, would you like to share with us, please? Sure. So I'm here representing, I guess, the dance aspect of uh, creative. And uh, as it was mentioned earlier, I'm one of three artistic directors with a new dance school here in the city called Dance Collective YXE. We were formerly the University School of Dance, uh, which shut down post-COVID, or I guess as COVID happened, it didn't shut up as a result of COVID, but it just kind of was the exit. And so um, at that point, um, our families and our community um, came to us instructors and said, what are our options? And there really was no options. We are the only inclusive dance school here in the city in terms of the diversity of programming that we offer. And even we can go so much as in Western Canada. So there is no wheelchair dance team anywhere in Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, or Manitoba for that matter that I know of that actually offers the range of ages that we do. And then as far as the Spirit Flyers dance program, um, there are some dance schools that have tried to start to initiate that type of programming, um, but have not gotten to the point that we're at. And um, there is maybe only one that I can count on my hand that I know of in the city that is starting to explore those options. So. As a result, we decided to create a Dance Collective, which is a nonprofit dance school. So it's a board of directors of family members um, that sit together along with uh, us three artistic directors. And uh, we try to offer programming for all families in all genres, so regular programming as well as diverse programming um, at an affordable rate. So our key is that, or our mission statement has always been that everyone should have an opportunity to dance. And there shouldn't be barriers regardless of space, regardless of financial, regardless of ability. So um, we have something available for everybody and the supports necessary in order for that to happen. So I started 22 years ago with uh, Spirit Flyers and it was a vision of mine just from talking with a, a fellow mentor of mine that had went and visited a group down in New York City that has a dance company ranging from 13 year olds all the way to 78 year olds um, and a variety of abilities. Uh, there are some um, 
individuals in chairs, there are some stands-ups, there are um, some that are visually impaired, hearing impaired, all come together and dance weekly together. And when I heard about that, I had no experience prior to that, but I said, why can't we do that here? And so I just jumped in with no previous training or knowledge beyond my technical training of 18 years here in the city and uh, experimented or started with four dancers. And we, as I just learn and grow each year, we have now gone 22 years and have diversified our program to meet specific needs that are kind of presented itself as, as we go. So that's what I bring to the, to the discussion today is I guess the, the adaptations and the modifications that we've done in the dance field in terms of accommodating everybody. Very cool. Oh, I really love your go-getter spirit that you had this vision and you made it happen. You know, so many people have a vision, but they, for whatever reason, sometimes, you know, things happen in life and it's not able to materialize, but I really love how your vision materialized. I was wondering specifically, you know, when the pandemic hit and everything went on Zoom, how was that for dance dancers and your dance collective? It definitely was a learning curve for everyone involved. I would say that I'm not super techie so savvy either, but uh, it was hard because part of our uniqueness is coming together and dancing together. So to dance in everybody's own basements uh, at one point where we couldn't be together in a studio was difficult, but I guess just even seeing each other's, because we're more than just the technical moves, we're the were the, the, the social aspect of dance as well. So just even seeing faces on the screen and interacting and how was your week and what's new in your world, those kind of things, we tried to keep that connect going. Um, and some people had more space in their house versus others, so we just ad adjusted and accommodated, but definitely we were, there was lots of air high fives and open air hugs when we were able to come back in space, even if we were in taped squares that we had to stay six feet apart. Mm -hmm. um, just being together was definitely uh, what it was all meant to be. So the Zoom was just temporary <laughs> for two months until we could come back masked, whatever we needed to do. If we needed to be in hazmat suits, we would do it just to be able to be in the space together. Uh, and everyone actually adhered to the, to the squares and we kept our social distancing and masking, of course, and sanitizing everything. But uh, it was def definitely difficult because dance is so much the social part too. Definitely would be an additional challenge for sure. Yeah. I was thinking in terms of arts and accessibility. So a little bit of an anecdote. When I first started getting interested primarily in disability theology, but disability life in general, like I said, about 10 years ago now, my first year of seminary, let you do the math again. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, and I, I understand that people here, you know, come from such diverse backgrounds, so I'm not assuming that everybody uh, follows a particular religion, a particular faith or anything like that. Everybody has their own path and their own journey. But one of the things that struck me was the fact that only 6% of deaf Christians are able to attend church. It's not because the other 94% wouldn't like to be there or, you know, something like that. It's because church is pretty much extremely oral. Everything that happens in church, whether singing hymns, whether hearing a sermon preached, completely oral. So not many churches are able to have sign language interpreters or maybe they don't have the funding for it in it, et cetera. So it just kind of struck me as a simple thing that is part of a lot of people's lives. And again, not assuming that everybody here believes in that or is part of that, but a simple like routine that's part of a lot of people's lives, which they're not able to access. So I was thinking of that, Joanna, as you were sharing about some of the work that you do in theater with describing for people who are visually impaired and so forth. And so I was just wondering if maybe you could say a little bit more about that in terms of someone who really enjoys going to theater and some of the challenges they may face. Sure. Yeah, uh, theater, when people think about theater, they think a lot of it as a visual form. And that's um, certainly like at a huge barrier and and there's so much to hear but it's, it's hard to there's so much more to theater than just what you see on stage it's the way that the actors speak and the way that they uh, move their feet and things like that um, there's a lot of a lot of barriers that were 
pushing through as a community and realizing now it's taken us too long mm. in a lot of ways to come together. Like I said, I received my training in the fall. There's four of us now that have this training in the city and it's something that we're really passionate about and wanting to bring to all theater in the city. That's definitely a huge goal, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, there's so much that someone like myself who doesn't have a disability that I don't think of. There's so many things that I take for granted. So yeah, it's really interesting to hear more about some of those challenges for sure. Uh, now I will just open it up to anybody on the panel who would like to answer. I find that for most people who consider themselves creatives or artists in whatever capacity, many of us have a role model or maybe somebody that we look up to who has kind of informed our work. So I'm wondering if anybody here would like to share about someone who has informed the work that you do. Um, I guess I would say that my role models are my students, um, hence why I'm still 22 years later still doing what I do along with everything else. Um, they're the ones who inspire me weekly to, to think outside the box or to come back next week with a different way of perhaps attacking a move or a sequence or a combination that would be attainable by all. Um, the wheelchair dance group, all the choreography is based with a sit-down dancer um, focus. So I am not a sit-down dancer person, so I have to physically get in a chair and how would I want to express this move as if I was a stand-up but now I'm a sit-down or how, how would I best be able to, to get a, a, across the movement and the, the expression that I'm wanting, wanting to give. So I would say that that's my role model. I didn't come from a, any, like I said, any formal training with that. I had my technical training of stand-up dancing but uh, it's my weekly encounters with my students that inspire me to keep going, I guess. That's really powerful. Yeah. Open mic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of two uh, for me, and one's an old one and one's a new one. And the old one is, is Canadian writer Jean Little. Many of you may know her work. The late Jean Little was a wonderful children's author that um, for most of her life, wrote uh, as a blind person. And so the themes in her work uh, are sometimes characters with blindness, but sometimes characters with other disabilities. And she had the amazing technique of writing about characters that felt like real people and creating books that weren't issues books that had a story arc, uh, that had a universal theme that touched us all. So as a writer, I think I'd, I'd pick her as one of my favorites. Um, a new person that I just encountered uh, their work, there's an OSAC show at the Rothstein Arts Center. It was on last week, it may still be on. Um, there's an artist named Jennifer McCrory and her show is called She Will Make Her Own Mark. Uh, her show celebrates her daughter uh, who is a person born with a genetic disorder and recreating her daughter's drawings with embroidery thread. She felt that her daughter wasn't able to share her voice, so this mom, artist mom, is sharing her daughter's voice, creative abilities, um, even as her daughter is shaped by genetics and biology. She will make her own mark. So I'd recommend that Rothstein show, mm -hmm. that OSAC show, O-S-A-C, if anybody's interested. Uh, so, my role model is Brenda Baker because oh. she is, well she, well, she is really, like, the, like she's really nice. And, uh, well, if people want to learn about music, um, uh, I want to uh, learn how to write music from my, from, my, from my feelings. So, sometimes I feel like heartbreak and uh, I feel upset, I feel sad. So, to, to, to say, okay. So uh, how do you feel? Well, I'm really mad because I, I, I miss this person and I, I can't get over it. So I kind of feel that way with my friends, but I feel that way in choir because when I, when I go choir about COVID, it's kind of ugly, like, because COVID made me all ugly. So I was saying, why, like, why did COVID like, made me feel ugly in this situation? It was really, how COVID really destroyed my life because COVID, 
was hurting my feelings. I had, I had no house to be, and I was at home dealing with my emotions. It was insane. Mm -hmm. but, but I really want to focus on music and move on. And I, and I, I, and I, I, and I was involved with dance. I started dancing with Georgie, she was my dance teacher. I really liked her, and she was helping me doing dancing. And my favorite song to dance to was September. I was doing the part when I was doing this part, and I was doing that. <laughs> and I was doing that, and I really, I really loved that dancing. Like, I missed doing it. That's why I decided to quit dance, because it's too much, and I moved out, so it was too much. So. Awesome. You know, Brenda Baker is also one of my role models. You know, she's a great person. One, a funny story about Brenda. I hope you don't mind I share this. A funny story about Brenda. So I am recently moved to Saskatoon. I've only been here since September. And I came to finish my chaplaincy studies and also for a job. And so I started attending Grosvenor Park like the first weekend that I arrived in Saskatoon. And I had gotten to know Brenda, you know, for a few weeks. and. Yeah, she was a really nice person and had all these nice things to say and, you know, she was actually giving me a ride home sometimes before I had my car here. And then it wasn't until we had a fundraiser and Brenda came and she was uh, singing and then I realized that she was famous, but she had never mentioned that. <laughs> so she was one of my heroes, you know, just for Aww, being so humble so and so talented and gifted. <laughs> so sweet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Joanna, do you have a role model you'd like to share about? Yeah, there's... um. There's a company out of Regina called Listen to Dis, and they are uh, a group of people that are uh, disabled artists themselves, but uh, also reach out to communities in a greater sense. And in the pandemic, they like kept going and created these opportunities for workshops where they bring people in, and there was a workshop over Zoom every week, and they're still doing it to this day. They're such like leaders in our community, and I, everyone should go in and watch their their participate in the workshops um, because they're really well curated and really thoughtful and yeah they they're they're a great company out of Regina but yeah well that's one good thing out of Regina <laughs> just, just joking though but that sounds awesome that sounds like a great collective for sure yeah. So sometimes when I, you know, start talking and start visiting with people, I lose a little bit of track of time. So I did want to open it up to anybody who has questions or comments to the panelists, if someone would like to address something to them. Naboku. Uh, thank you. I have this stereotype, and that stereotype is that for creatives, creatives create because in whatever media they choose because they have a story to share, and the media that they choose to share it with is the one that is most connected to their hearts. So I guess my question is, um, and it goes back to the uh, sociology um, stories that happened early this morning, first panel. And uh, uh, Kelly Bird and Tauha was talking about listening to the sacred stories. So my question is, if you could simply, which is not easy, tell part of your sacred story, the reason why you love doing what you do what would that part of your sacred story be? Well, I'll pipe up and, and just say, because I've been directing Kids of Note now for, is it 18 years or something now? Um, uh, the sacred story for me is, of course, uh, having a, had a daughter with Down syndrome and having been awoken to an um, amazingly rich community of people, of children, um, without whom I wouldn't be who, who I've become. You know, I really believe that on our journeys we meet people who are, uh, who influence our spirits who, who dictate to a certain degree 
how, who, who we're going to become and who we're becoming. And I'd say that uh, it, the journey for me started with, with Tori. And so that's a little bit of my sacred story. Do you have a little bit of a story? Yeah. So uh, I remember watching that video uh, about Tori that she passed away. I, I, I recently found out on my phone, I calculated, I, I like, how old is she? She's, she's like 20 years old. I was like, what? I, I, I was pretty shocked. Cause, she would have been 20. Yeah, yeah. yeah she, like she would have been. She so, been 20, but she was five when she died. Yeah, so uh, I actually remember watching that video. I saw myself, uh, as a YouTube video, I was so surprised seeing myself singing. I was like, oh my gosh, I did it. I did it. I was like, oh my gosh, I was so, like, I was so happy, but I heard some people crying, but it was okay for me. I really enjoyed it. I really want to say thank you for everyone for inviting me here today. And I really, I, really, I really love to have my parents, my mom, my dad, and Jackie. Jackie, I really, I really like your story because you were, just, I was like, because, they, because you are really smart and, and I really want to be with everyone. And, uh, and, uh, and with Brenda, I really like her because she's really nice. And Baba, I have a story about you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the way you, the, the way you say it, I must stay home. So, so my, so my story is, I want to do is stay home and eat chips, because I love to eat chips, and I really want to eat chips. Like I really do. Like I say, I want to do is stay home and eat chips. <laughs> like, like my parents don't understand that. What? Tatiana likes chips too. Yeah, I do. <laughs> like it's a joke. It's like oh, it's not a joke. I don't know. I think for me, I just know how important stories are. I think they really can change the world, and I think it's important to take the time to listen to other people's stories and think about what our own stories truly are. So that's mine. I, I, uh, I have anxiety, and uh, I'm prone to shaking and being very nervous. Uh, speaking in front of people is my worst fear, which um, sounds outrageous when I say that I'm an actor. Um, and I think that's the biggest part is when I'm an actor and when I'm on stage is an opportunity where I don't feel anxious. And the first time that I felt like at peace, not overthinking everything I was doing and was just able to be a human and, and, uh, and explore my impulses without second guessing everything. It was life changing the first time I was on stage and got to experience that. And so a big part of my story is wanting others to experience that as well, to have that opportunity of that, that release of not feeling anxious and um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for sharing. Those were some very powerful stories. Is there any other questions or comments from the audience? Okay, Gary. Well, you guys are talking about secret stories. Uh, well, I'll tell you. I, uh, <clears throat> let's see, my secret stories. I forgot to mention that today to myself. Um, having a tough situation as a child, taken away from your parents' arms, I guess. Um, I became very strong in life later on, in life. I didn't realize I was going to be used in this country to, to speak for others that cannot speak for themselves, right? My strength is, is my family, friends, the reason why, why I became like this, there was a purpose in life, in my life. 
Number two, even coming from a suicide family, as my father, you know, what I said yesterday, I think I didn't want to follow my father's footsteps or my mother's footsteps. I can change the world. The experience that we experience in our lives today. And may I, sometimes I sat by myself, my, my quiet moment, you know. Someday, all of us are going to be legends if we keep up the good work, what we're doing today. Someday, we'll have that mark in this country. Even all Aboriginal people, uh, Métis people, Blackfoot Indians, uh, North America Indians, we're, we're, we are part of, of this world. We just want to be part of the decision making. So that's my secret story. Those stories that you talked about today. I can make those decisions for myself. I don't have to be told what's good for Gary anymore. Now I have the controls like a pilot now. I can go land wherever I want to land and go tell the people this is what we need. And all of us are the same. We sleep the same, we have the same pants, but maybe different cultures. We think the same, we feel the same. And all that stuff. And that's my story. Thank you for sharing, Gary. You know, and when we talk about art inclusion, the purpose of this weekend was primarily, you know, including people with and without disabilities and integrating together. But I believe one of the amazing things about art is how it transcends culture, gender. There's really no rules to art. Like anybody pretty much can be an artist. Anybody is welcomed into art, whether or not they consider themselves an artist. So really appreciate your thoughts on that topic as well. I think we have time for about one last question or comment from the audience, if anybody has one. May I make a volunteer comment? Sure. Just because it's mentioned in the description. And I would just invite everyone to go and look up Arts Access Australia, because this is a, an incredible program that is run right across the country of Australia. And it has, um, it touches all uh, disciplines of the arts and it is um, uh, positioned so that um, all people with any kind of disability have access to arts programming. So, um, it, I mean, I just can't see why we don't have something like that in Canada. And we have already, through Australia, a, a wonderful case study of how it's, how it's working. So, um, I, I just wanna put it out there for folks to consider just just imagining um, if we could do something like that in this, in this place. I, I don't see why we couldn't. That, and that's all I wanted to get out on the floor for that. Thanks, Brenda. It is definitely an amazing project. I Googled it a little bit, and like Brenda said, it would be amazing if anybody's interested to find out some more information as well. So I just want to thank all the panelists again for being here and sharing part of your sacred story and sharing your passion and your interest and let's just give everybody a round of applause. Maybe better done from down here than uh, amongst the, the uh, panelists there. I, uh, was asked to just make a few final remarks since this is the last uh, session of our day and uh, make a few thank yous as well. 
I'm first going to mention, in case I forget, um, that tomorrow, uh, Sunday morning worship, uh, we have our featured uh, minister, Kathleen uh, James Cavan, who's going to be um, doing a, an interesting sermon related to what we've been exploring together this last day and a half. And do you want to just say what the name of the sermon is? Do you, do you remember it? Maybe just to whet people's appetites. Yeah, I, I think I called it um, um, Disability Justice and the Disabled Church. So I'm looking at the disabled church. We are together. <laughs> yeah, it'll be very interesting, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I want to remind you that there's, again, a spread of wonderful food at the back, I hope people will stay and eat some of it because otherwise a lot of us are going to go home with <laughs> boxes full of it. And we have some hot hors d'oeuvres uh, to enjoy as well as some cheese and crackers and so forth. So please stay and visit for, for a few moments um, and I hope that you have the time for, for doing that. Um, uh, some other thank yous that I'd like to uh, get out there. Uh, of course, all of our panelists, and especially Gary and Ken, are our keynote speakers. So well, let's give a round of applause for all of, the, all of you and our moderators. And uh, last night's performers did a terrific job for us. All of our volunteers, um, especially those who kept us fed and watered, and especially Dawn Weber. Can you hear me right now, Dawn Weber? Oh, Dawn Weber, that's Dawn, give her a big hand. She did a terrific job getting all the food organized. <laughs> our sponsors, which uh, we've mentioned a couple of times in the course of our conference already, but they contributed thousands of dollars to make this possible and to make it possible for us to not have to ask people to do things for free, but to pay all of our panelists. So let's give our sponsors another round. And our ASL interpreters here, uh, this is Carla and that's Brandy. You guys have been working so hard all day, so thank you very much. <laughs> our technician, Dylan Evans, has been up there and looking down on us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's been just amazing because as you can see, there's been a lot to do for him. So thank you, Dylan. And to the congregation of Grosvenor, um, United for, for actually coming up with this, uh, uh, getting behind it, and, and uh, I, all the people here that are from the church, thank you very much for supporting this venture. And our organizing committee of Mariah, Mariah Hillis, Deb Sperber, Kathleen James Cavan, uh, Nabucco EY, and myself. I'm going to put myself on the list. And um, thanks also to all of you for attending and we hope that you found it interesting and, and enjoyable to to be with us so um, we have one little exercise for you to do you would have been handed a, a card with a post-it note on it we were calling it an intention card and we'd like you to do two things one is to just take a few minutes before we break for food to consider out of everything that you've heard in the last while um, is there one intention that you might like to do, a personal intention, that would make a difference to the disability community? It could be a small thing, it could be a big thing. And would you write that down and tuck that card away somewhere just so you remember your intention? Because I know from going to some fabulous conferences myself, uh, I have gone out with all sorts of spirit and energy and then that within a few days, I've completely forgotten <laughs> what it was that I really thought I might do out of this experience. It might be as simple as trying to find a, an appropriate book that you will, like the book that we just heard about up here from, from Bev. It might be trying to find, what was the name of that book again? Um, Kenneth Opal? Oh yeah, uh, Darkwing. Darkwing. It might be just say, I'm gonna get that book from the library. Or it might be something like, I'm gonna organize something at my workplace to start a conversation about uh, inclusion and disabilities. That's the kind of idea. And then, if you wouldn't mind, because it's anonymous, if you would also write your intention on the post-it note, the little yellow post-it note that was attached to the intention card, and stick it up on one of the um, easels at the back there. 
And then we would have a kind of an interesting perspective on what intentions might be coming out of this conference. So that was our, our thought. Oh, and then there's the evaluation forms too. If you haven't already, to take just a few minutes, it, it shouldn't take too long to fill that out. And you, where should we drop these off, Nabucco? An offering table, an offering plate on the background table, so you can just set them on the plate there. So that's it. And I believe that that is everything. So take a few moments for contemplation, uh, evaluation, and then we're, and we're going to turn the music on like right away. And so we're going to have a party for a while. So thank you all again for being here. That's very nice meeting.